All right. So as Professor Obergat said, uh, my name is Brian Powell. Uh, I am here to talk about X-ray scattering. And since I only have 40 minutes, I will dive right in. Uh, very briefly, X-ray scattering is a technique to characterize the nanostructure in your materials. Um, we measure scattering patterns, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, and then we can turn this into size distributions. Um, so we can get some uh, structural information out for pretty much any material which has a fine structure inside. We usually get you know, size distributions and volume fractions out over a very wide size range. Now, this was done on aerogels, but we measure a whole host of materials. This is a list of the materials that we've measured over the last uh, three, four years. Um, so just a couple of highlights. Uh, we have measured uh, porous carbon catalysts from the Schnapp group uh, here at the University of Birmingham. Uh, we measured resins, rubbers, core shell particles, nanoparticles in solution, nanoparticles in composites, uh, membrane materials. We measure battery materials, uh, such as the one developed here, again here at UOB. Um, we, in the next couple of weeks, we will get some teeth and bone and blood, uh, and we will measure those. And we've already already measured some hair, so we've got, you know, some parts of humans there as well. Um, although we try to stay out of the uh, out of the biological field, we pretty much specialize in everything else. Uh, so we can do moth particles, geological particles. Um, uh, metals, alloys. Um, there's really anything which has uh, which has a fine structure in it, which is contrasting in electron density. So, as if you can see it in your electron microscope, we can probably uh, quantify that. Now, we don't really synthesize any materials in our lab. Um, uh, my lab essentially consists of me and my colleague, uh, Dr. Glenn Smales. Um, and we specialize in the methodology development. So we develop X-ray scattering as a technique. I mean, it's been around for 100 years, but we've really managed to fine tune it um, uh, to a high degree so that we get really awesome data out. Now, I can claim this, but it'd be nice if we can actually prove this, right? So that is why we're always happy to collaborate with excellent material scientists, not just at the fun, but mostly also at external institutes. So that means collaborating with you. So if at the end of this talk, you think, hmm, maybe X-ray scattering could add a little bit to my materials investigation, then please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, I think this really, this multidisciplinary approach to doing science is really the key to doing science in the future where we combine all our knowledge and all our insights to get to a comprehensive materials insight uh, for the beautiful materials that you are developing. So today's talk uh, will introduce X-ray scattering. Um, I aim to briefly touch on the basics. There's a lot of details and a lot of fine uh, um, uh, peculiarities that come up in many of these aspects, but I hope to be able uh, to leave you with a little bit of a little bit of knowledge about how this technique actually works. Then I will spend a few words to talk about our instrument, our methodology, what we've done to develop it, and what uh, environments we have available for you. And then the last third of this talk is uh, basically up to you. I can talk a lot about a lot of different topics. Um, I've prepared a couple of sort of mini presentations, and then you can choose what you want me to talk about because yeah, uh, you are essentially uh, uh, the best people to know what you are interested in. Anyway, on to the basics. What is X-ray scattering? Well, as the name suggests, this is a form of scattering. Um, and scattering you can do with all, ki all kinds of radiation. You can do scattering with light. Uh, many of you will be familiar with the dynamic light scattering. You can also do static light scattering. You can do neutron scattering. You can do electron scattering. Uh, you know, electron diffraction is a subfield of electron scattering. However, X-rays are by far the coolest of them all. And um, here, I must briefly 
Oh yeah, I'm actually also sharing sound. Okay. Um, you know, they are by far the coolest, as explained by Dr. Uh, William Coolidge here uh, from the General Electric's lab um, from the 1950s. For a long time, after X-rays were discovered and used, they remained a mystery even to the scientist. That is how they got their name, X for the unknown. So, yes, we work with X-rays. Um, the X-ray scattering principle usually uh, is done in the same way. Uh, regardless of what angles you're measuring to, you typically start with an X-ray source. You monochromatize your radiation, or at least you know as best you can, so you end up with um, with X-ray photons within a fairly narrow energy band. Then you cut down these X-rays with a collimator, uh, so that you get a nice shaped beam out. In our case, about half a millimeter across. Um, electron density differences in your sample will cause a small fraction of this radiation to be scattered and diffracted. Now, in most cases, we stop the direct beam with a beam stop to improve our signal, and we collect the scattered radiation onto our detector. And it seems simple in theory, and it is actually also simple in practice. The machines very much reflect this principle. Uh, this is a schematic of what our machine looked like uh, when we started working with it. Uh, it has two X-ray sources. We have a copper source and a molybdenum source. So we have different X-ray photon energies we can play around with. And um, this has turned out to be more useful than I thought it would be. <laughs> um, there is a three-slit collimation after the sources, uh, after the monoch monochromator uh, that's stuck to the sources. Um, this, with these with these three slit collimations, we can, we can then cut down the beam um, to whatever size and shape we want. Uh, we have a very large sample chamber. Uh, this is a very large vacuum sample chamber that is much larger than any of the other instruments that I've worked on. And it allows us to put in lots of experimental uh, setups that might be of interest uh, of interest to you, and in this barrel at the end, there is a fairly modest uh, hybrid pixel detector on a motorized carriage, so we can move it backwards, forwards, and sideways. So, X-ray scattering, as I've, as I've already sort of hinted, can be done uh, to a very wide range of angles. You can do ultra small angle X-ray scattering to capture the uh, larger structures, up to a few microns. You can do a small angle X-ray scattering, uh, analyzing the structural details from about one nanometer to a few hundred nanometers. Um, you can do wide angle X-ray scattering, and that really captures sort of the angstrom length scales. Um, X-ray diffraction is a form of wide angle X-ray scattering for samples where your structure is regular, a regular lattice or, uh, or a regular structure. And then there's something called total scattering, which in my view is a little bit of a misnomer. It is not all of the above, but total scattering is sort of wide angle scattering plus plus, right? It's a little bit wider angles that you're measuring and thereby you get a little bit more information about the interatomic structure in your sample. So that's one of the reasons why we have our detector on a carriage um, inside our instrument. Uh, it is so that we can move it close to our sample uh, and collect uh, wide angle scattered radiation. Um, here it says 139 millimeters. Actually, these days we go to about four centimeters behind the sample, so 14 millimeters uh, behind the sample. And then I lose my nerve. Uh, in principle, we can run the detector through the sample and that will be the end of our detectors. But, so, to capture the widest angles is always a bit of a, a, a nervous moment, but so far it's gone all right. Um, and then we can move this detector further back and basically zoom in into the central section of the, uh, of the pattern on the top left, um, getting a little bit more information about the uh, larger structures in your materials, and we can move it in the end uh, down to two and a half meters from our sample thereby collecting uh, the smallest angles that we can get with this particular configuration. 
Now, we don't really look at these segments individually. We measure all of this for all of our samples, uh, and then we usually combine the information uh, into a single curve. Um, this scattering pattern is an example of one of the materials uh, that is developed at the University of Birmingham. It's uh, one of the porous carbon catalysts from the Schnepp group. Um, and this pattern shown here combines, I think, six or seven different data sets um, into a single curve. So you now see that we have, uh, that we can span about four orders of magnitude in angle at the bottom and about, well, eight, nine orders of magnitude in intensity uh, on the vertical axis. And this gives, gives us a lot of insight into the structure in your material. We have information here ranging from the sub angstrom range to several hundred nanometers. So we have information on the crystalline structure of the iron carbide nanoparticles inside this material. We have information on the particles themselves, whether or not they're crystalline, that's totally fine for us. They can be completely amorphous as long as they have contrast with the surrounding matrix, we will see those particles. And then in this case, we also have information on the porous structure uh, of the carrier uh, in this material. So this really gives us a lot of in, uh, insight uh, in, in the material, and we can quantify each one of these features. And normally, when you're thinking about analyzing anything in, uh, in these size ranges, you would think about using electron microscopy, and you would be absolutely right. Electron microscopy is essential to understanding the structure inside your material. Um, it's, and it's high resolution analog, um, you know, it can provide beautiful details about uh, the stuff that you have created, especially when this is done in the hands of an expert uh, electron microscopist. And the electron microscopist will be able to tell you whether um, structures are real or whether they are instrumental artifacts. When it comes to quantifying this, however, things get a little bit more tricky, right? Um, if automated methods fail, even if they even if they don't fail, you know. But if automated methods fail, then you have to manually uh, count and measure each one of these projections of precipitates, um, which is a very tedious task. And once you've done that, you've only analyzed a microscopic volume of material because that's all that you can all that you can look look at. And this microscopic volume might, may or may not be representative for the bulk uh, in, your, um, in your materials. So you'd really like to combine electron microscopy with a technique that can quantify much larger amounts of volume. So atom probe tomography, fairly recent technique, uh, can do a little bit better in terms of sample volume, but it really um, gets large when you think about using x-ray techniques because these techniques can quantify uh, the structure in, say, a cubic millimeter of material, right? Much more bulk than you would ever uh, be able to get. You could even tack on micro X-ray computer tomography to this to get even larger uh, structures quantified. Um, and if you think that a cubic millimeter is not enough for you, you can go to neutron scattering, right? Because everything is bigger with neutrons. The reactors are bigger, the instruments are bigger, the shielding is bigger, and certainly the samples are bigger as well. So there you're working with cubic centimeters of material rather than cubic millimeters that we're working with. There's another benefit to these techniques, and that is because these are, in principle, non-destructive. Now, I say in principle because if you go to the synchrotron, their beams have become so bright that you're dumping an enormous amount of energy in, in, a, in a very small volume of your sample, thereby changing your sample. There has been a recent paper um, that came out from Wim Brass um, that has many demonstrations of this effect. However, in the laboratory, our laboratory sources are not so bright. There's a very little chance that they will do anything to your materials. So um, we can fairly happily claim to be non-destructive in that case. However, since it's non-destructive, we can actually do in situ experiments. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Um, 
So, um, unlock my other computer again, because <laughs> I want to tell you what is actually in these patterns, right? So in electron micrographs, it's fairly easy to see um, actual structure and to relate it in your mind to, 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 to a physical morphology of your samples. Not so in X-ray scattering. You see in the wide angle range, you see these rings, and in the small angle range, it usually looks like something like a blob. So what is actually in that information? Um, well, as it so happens, uh, it, uh, the intensity that we see on our detector can be related to the electron density in your material by means of a Fourier transform. So you know, mathematically speaking, our instrument is a Fourier transformer for anything we stick into the beam. And that is, in principle, fantastic, right? So you might think, OK, so if it is a Fourier transform, why don't we take our intensity and inverse Fourier transform it, and we have our 3D electron map out again. That would be nice. However, we are not measuring all of the Fourier transform. We're only measuring the intensity of the Fourier transform. So we've lost essential phase information that we would need to do this inverse Fourier transform again. So that is a bit of a that is a bit of a, a downer. It's basically been the, the problem in small angle scattering for the last hundred years. Now I know that many of you will not be familiar with Fourier transforms. I myself learned about them only at the end of my PhD. Um, but I've created a visualization that I hope will help uh, at least give you a feeling about what Fourier transforms actually are. Right? So mathematically speaking, they are um, they're transforming your uh, uh, three-dimensional electron density in a frequency map. So we have, um, we have frequencies uh, with, the lar with the lowest frequencies on the left-hand side and the um, higher frequencies on the, on the high end. But I can show you what that looks like for a variety of, well, printouts, really, with shapes on them. So if we have a sphere in our scattering instrument, uh, you see that we actually get these, uh, these sort of fringes in our scattering pattern on the top right-hand side. Um, and as I mentioned, if we make the sphere larger, these fringes actually increase in size. And I should have chosen better paper because these are nearly impossible to take apart. All right. However, so if I have a, a larger sphere, you see these fringes almost disappear. I need to drag it back a little bit so you can see a little bit of that, uh, of those fringes still in the images. Um, and likewise, if I go to smaller objects, these fringes will actually, um, uh, well, the frequency will reduce. And therefore, we can measure their significant features to wider angles in the scattering pattern, as shown at the bottom. Now, due to this phase, uh, the loss of phase information uh, by Binet's principle, I cannot distinguish a white sphere on a black background from a black sphere on a white background. They both look uh, or they both scatter exactly the same. So there, therein lies the, really the problem with X-ray scattering uh, data analysis. Now, if I have oriented objects, I get an oriented scattering pattern, uh, and this rotates with the object as you would expect it to. Uh, so that's the only thing that makes sense in Fourier space is the rotations are still normal. Um, and if you have funnier shapes like cubes, uh, then your patterns also change accordingly. Now it's almost Christmas again, so I can actually show the next shape as well, which is one of my favorite ones, because it produces a really nice scattering pattern, a star. Um, now, normally, however, you don't have a single particle in your, uh, in, in, in your X-ray scattering experiment. You have a... Um, a bunch of particles. If you have a bunch of particles, a bunch of identical spheres, then you still see these fringes up here. However, if you have polydispersity in your sample, uh, 
your fringes disappear and you basically end up with a smooth um, scattering pattern. Uh, there's still information in there about the size and the size distribution of these, uh, of these scattering objects. They're just all, over, all overlapping and you need to pick them apart. If we have uh, oriented uh, scatterers like this, we get an oriented scattering pattern, uh, which again rotates with the uh, or rotates with the object. You get this a lot in um, in processed materials like rolled rolled metal sheets or drawn fibers. Now, since I have this Fourier transformer, um, I might as well explain X-ray diffraction. X-ray diffraction is what you get when you have a regular uh, structure of objects. That's, that's when you get these diffraction peaks to show up. Um, and if I align this thing perpendicular to the camera, then it will actually show up the best, right? So that was a, that was a square array. That's not my favorite, but one of the other arrays that we actually see a lot in practice is hexagonal arrays, right? And hexagonal arrays is really nice. You see, uh, superimposed on these uh, on these basic diffraction spots, you see still these oscillating fringes. That is your form factor, which you also have in X-ray diffraction. Uh, in that case, it's an atomic form factor. Um, I printed out some extra ones, but I think they essentially show us show us the same with alternating lattices, or even alternating lattices in one direction. Um, so you can download this program for free. Uh, I made it open source. I made it a long time ago. You can play around or use it in your own uh, presentations as well, if you want. Um, so back to my presentation. Uh, so what can we do? Well, if we want to analyze this, uh, these scattering patterns, we can compare the intensity that we measure with the intensity that we can simulate from either analytical Fourier transformation of a three-dimensional model or by calculating, uh, I've written uh, something that can calculate scattering patterns from STL files, right? So you can load up any file that you have and um, get a model intensity out. And then what you can do is you can compare these two. That is what all of you are probably doing on a daily basis. You're comparing a model with your data. And you will know that this works the best when you bring these two closest, closer together or as close as possible together. And that means in our case, we need to account for reality in our models, including things like polydispersity, beam smearing, um, multiple scattering, um, uh, and the whole host of other effects, uh, extra backgrounds, extra contributions that might actually be in your sample. Uh, and we can correct the data for imperfections. I, was, I spent a few years on this topic um, because in our experimental setup, we have made a lot of compromises, right? We need to compromise between the beam size, for example, and the X-ray flux. I cannot have an infinitesimally small beam. Um, I have an imperfect detector. Um, it's very nice, but it's still imperfect. I have an imperfect setup uh, to hold my samples. Lots of extra things that we need to correct for so that we can isolate the analyte signal, the, the, the signal of the structure that we're actually interested in from all the other contributions in our data. Um, so what did we do, right? Um, well, apart from these data corrections, we have basically taken uh, our instrument as it arrived and we started to modify it. This instrument was built with the concept, um, a fairly traditional concept, that uh, users would come in, we would train the users, they would click a few buttons, load a sample, click a few more buttons, do a measurement, you know, and then go home with, an, uh, with a hard disk full of images. And two weeks later, they would call up and say, oh, sorry, I forgot to take some backgrounds, or do you remember how the instrument was set up, or something like that. That is um, not very efficient, uh, especially when this lab is only run by two people. That's not something that we could support in that way. So now we are doing everything for the users. We're collaborating with them, but we are doing the measurements in a very high throughput way. That means that we needed to modify the machine 
It now looks like this. Uh, we've added things like motor drives, uh, an Epix control server. We've added uh, or we've changed the uh, sample stage uh, of this instrument to a much better one, change of chiller. But most of all, we've taken away the user interface that came with this instrument and we wrote our own. So this is something that we published about. Uh, basically, the whole methodology that we have developed around this instrument to get really good data in a very efficient way has been published earlier this year. Uh, this is a massive paper, 50 pages going into excruciating detail about all of the finer uh, details uh, behind this. But uh, I think it's, I think that I'm very happy with this paper. Um, anyway, so one of the Reasons that we can be so very efficient is that we can load now um, sample holders like you see at the bottom, where we can put up to 48 so solid samples in place, or mix and match with some capillary holders that you see at the top right. Um, and that means that when we run the instrument, we can let it run for three weeks, measuring um, up to 48 samples, um, or usually a, a week, a week and a half, uh, when we mix it with liquids. So we have, through these improvements, we've um, gained a lot in efficiency. And just, you can see maybe in the green curve, that is the curve for this year. Um, we had a downtime earlier this year when our detector was broken. We needed to send it back to the, uh, to the company for repair. Um, however, after that, we came back uh, with some upgrades and we're now even beating our 2020 record, which was fairly impressive to begin with. So we're well on track to measuring, uh, to measuring this year for 50% of the year. That means for 50% of the time available in a year, we are exposing the detector uh, with a particular sample measurement. All right. Um, I mentioned that we could do in situ testing. That means... Uh, that we're not really affecting the sample. We don't really need to do that much in terms of sample preparation. So we can add things like magnetic fields to the outside of your sample to see how your sample would react in these conditions. In this case, it's a magnetic field with uh, two very large permanent magnets. Um, we can do electric fields as well. Uh, we can do DC and AC electric fields to see if that would align your samples. In this case, of course, samples and liquids. Um, we can do tensile testing experiments so we can stretch your sample um, and see how that affects the nanostructure in your sample, right? Something must crack at some point. Um, here's, a, here's a sample, a tensile stage that I developed during my PhD, but now we're trying to implement a slightly more normal uh, 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 screw-based uh, tensile tester. We can also heat up your samples. Here's a heater that we're developing. Uh, this goes up to 400 degrees. It can heat with rates up to one degree per second. Uh, cooling down takes a bit longer. <laughs> um, and it can hold up to three samples. So you can measure your sample, your background, and uh, maybe an empty one as well, uh, all at the same temperature. We can do chemical experiments besides the instrument. So you can do your chemical reactions on a normal laboratory scale. And then we can pump a little bit of that reaction liquid through our measurement cell and back into the reactor. So you can basically follow your reaction as it progresses. We can add things like syringe injectors if you want specific things to happen at particular times in your reaction. And yeah, then we can, we can follow along. Now, our time resolution is not that great, right? So we can maybe do, um, well, with a decent data quality, we can do one measurement every 10 minutes. But if you have a reaction that takes hours or that takes days or even weeks, we can measure that. It's no problem for me to reserve the machine for three weeks. It's my machine. I can do what I want, essentially. Um, and if then you're not interested, not only interested in the long-term um, uh, long term kinetics, say room temperature aging or something, but you're also interested in very short-term reactions, 
uh, we will be very happy to um, to patch you through with our colleagues at the Diamond Light Source uh, I-22 beamline has the exact same data correction pipeline as we have in our lab. So the fast timescale um, uh, information that you can get from the synchrotron, where they do have the flux for that, for those sort of things, um, that information can be combined with the slow timescale information from our lab. Um, and if you just have static samples, you can just come to our lab because uh, we pretty much measure uh, to a very high standard. And 90 to 95% of the samples can simply be measured in a lab. All right, so now it's up to you. I can very much, or I would very much like to invite you to choose a topic. I can talk about the methodology that we've developed is basically the work over the last few years. Um, I can talk about ultrasax, uh, ultra small angle X-ray scattering, which is also a really cool topic. I can talk about round robin experiments uh, that we did to try and see how consistent the results of small angle scattering were. I can talk about composites and helices. And the six in the bottom left corner, they're basically older stories. Um, but I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, but uh, uh, so there, there are a few older stories there, but I didn't want to leave them out because they might just be interesting for you as well. So please leave in the chat um, your wishes, uh, what you would like me to talk about. And it's basically on a first come first serve basis. And I think we can, we can talk about uh, maybe two or three of these um, uh, short stories before my time is up. I was going mm -hmm. to say, Brian, we could have run a survey, you know, or a poll or something like that, <laughs> a, bit, a bit more preparation. Can we also pick something you haven't prepared for? <laughs> yes, you can. You can. You can do that too. I, I've got some. I've got some hidden slides uh, at the back as well, so just, just in case uh, people came up with a lot of questions. Right. So uh, I don't know if people have any specific topics they would like to. Oh, Phoebe, composites, please. Composites. Yes. yes. Composites. Uh, so you said you needed two or three, didn't you? Uh, yes, but uh, I can do a few things. Oh, oh, oh okay. no, it's yeah, pouring in my cells yeah, and cells. donuts and right. a donut features. So, so shall we do composites, my cells and donuts? Uh, we can do uh, as soon as I can find my cursor again. Where did it go? There it is. Um, I should get my cursor back. Yep, there we are. So um, yeah, we'll start with composites. Composites is actually a two-part story, but I didn't have time to finish the second part. The second part is still being uh, published at the moment. This is an earlier story where we developed most of the methodology for quantifying bromide nanoparticles in an epoxy matrix. So Paulina Shimoniak was doing her PhD uh, um, at BAM in a different group, and she filled an epoxy with bromide particles. And she wanted to know whether this nanofiller material was well spread out through the epoxy material or whether it was all clumped together and therefore not ideally affecting the mechanical properties of, um, of the composite. So we did some measurements. Uh, we have here a combined uh, scattering pattern. Um, it's not over, our, over the full range that we can do now, but this was sort of the range that we started with. We have um, a diffraction region in the right-hand side, and we have a small angle region in the left-hand side. And these two contain different pieces of information for us. So the composite we could, um, uh, the wide angle scattering of the composite, wide angle diffraction, we could basically, compose that signal from the scattering pattern of the pure of the pure epoxy and the pure filler and in doing so we could analyze um, we could get the volume fraction of crystalline material out um, and that I think was was kind of nice because it showed that that the, that these design volume fractions that uh, she put in were actually there in the final product now, that's not something we can do for the small angle scattering because you, you can see that you cannot recreate these small angle signals simply from a superposition of, uh, of the pure bromide signal and the uh, epoxy material itself. Uh, there is something else going on over there. So we've taken the small angle data and we've analyzed them all using a piece of software that I wrote uh, 10 years ago 
uh, eight years ago, maybe. Um, this extracts a size distribution uh, in a form-free way, right? So we can get um, uh, we can get a size distribution whether whether or not your nanostructure is uh, monomodal in distribution, multimodal, uh, triangular, Gaussian, or anything in between, right? So if we do this for the bromide particles, as shown here, you see that these particles have uh, have a mean size of about, or mean radius, I should say, of about eight uh, eight nanometers. So that means about sixteen nanometers across. Um, when we load them into the epoxy, we see another population coming up uh, to larger sizes. So this we can uh, we can fairly confidently say are aggregates of the, um, of the primary bromide particles. These are basically the clusters that we didn't want to, that we didn't want to have in the, um, in the epoxy. Um, and we can quantify the amount of particles that we can detect, both in aggregates as well as in uh, primary particles. Um, and we can quantify how much crystalline material we have from the wide angle. Uh, diffraction analysis, right? And you see there's a discrepancy going up. However, whenever we fill more than a, a certain amount of nanofiller inside this material, SACS measures fewer particles than there actually are according to the wide angle analysis. And that is because there are also clusters in there which we can no longer see with scattering. Uh, if we have clusters larger than a few microns, they don't contribute to the scattering pattern anymore. So we can now have we can now separate between three different populations: one primary particles, two small clusters or nano domains as they're called here, small clusters of primary particles, and then also large clusters of primary particles. Basically, the missing fraction in there. Um, and yeah, I think that was uh, that was quite a nice insight. And now there's additional research going on with. Um, with uh, polycarbonate electrospun fibers, where they've tried to do the same, but you know they got some even more information because these fibers were actually slightly porous and therefore complicated the whole matter, uh, the whole story a little bit. All right, the second uh, topic was um, my cells. Um, uh, uh -huh, my cells. Yeah. My cells is one of the or, uh, one of the older stories. This is uh, the story of, of um, Martin Hollenby, essentially, who is now at Keele University in the UK. Um, he was interested in finding out how um, fairly simple molecules behave when you immerse them in uh, in particular solvents. Um, so he took a buckyball, he, he attached a little bit of a chain to that buckyball, um, and then immersed these in, uh, in a variety of alkanes, right? And what these particles then do is they aggregate into a solvophobic part in the center and a solvophilic part on the outside. Um, so this forms micelles in this case. Um, and these micelles could be measured using uh, both neutron scattering and X-ray scattering. And you see that these two scattering patterns are different. And that's because the contrast of uh, X-ray scattering is based on the electron density. The um, neutron scattering contrast, however, is um, based on the, uh, on the atomic uh, density. And therefore, is much more sensitive uh, to the outside structure of, the, of these particles rather than just the inside. So with X-ray scattering, we could analyze the size distribution of the cores. And with neutron scattering, we could analyze the size distribution of the shell. And interestingly, if you then take this micellar solution and you cool it down to about five degrees uh, with a little bit of a change in lichens, these actually seem to aggregate into hexagonal structures uh, which self-assemble into fiber-like structures. And uh, Martin had these beautiful uh, optical images uh, showing very large uh, fibers being formed out of this out of this material. So that I think was uh, was really cool. We can also see this hexagonal structure in uh, the scattering patterns. They show up as these two peaks because we now have a regular arrangement of structures in there. 
Uh, and we actually tend to see hexagonal structures in quite a lot of the materials that we measure. So that's certainly not, not something very uncommon. And then when you heat up the sample again, these peaks disappear and the thing basically reverts to my cells. Um, more information in this paper, which came out in 2014 already. All right. Um, and the third one was? Donuts. Donuts. Donuts is <laughs> the follow-up story to that. Well, one of the follow-up stories to that. Um, it's again with Martin Hollenby, um, who created this material. Uh, well, uh, he was collaborating with, uh, with a Japanese scientist who had created this material. And when the Japanese scientists measured this under an atomic forest microscope, they noticed that these had seemed to have self-assembled into donut-like structures. Uh, with a, you know, uh, depending on what ligand you have, they're either slightly larger or slightly smaller. The biggest question here was, well, these exist when you've dried up this material from solution onto a surface, onto a surface, but do they actually exist in the solvent as well? Well, here we could do um, small angle neutron scattering and small angle X-ray scattering again, and this time Martin managed to do a simultaneous fit of the neutron and X-ray scattering data using a single model, uh, which I think is the future essentially uh, to take uh, to do multimodal analysis in this way. And he could find out for both of these uh, types of ligands, what the radius of the donut was, what the, the, the thickness and the width of the cross section was, um, and get even a little bit more information about the thickness of the shell in this donut. So that I think was uh, actually some, yeah, some really cool experiment. Now, I, if I have a minute left, I'll just skip to helices because this is the follow-up to that follow-up. This came out earlier. Um, I think uh, th this came out late last year. This is uh, with, uh, from the same group, if I'm not mistaken. Um, these people have continued, right? And they now started making helicoid structures, something that looks a little bit like vermicelli. And the, the way they did it, was they combined two types of uh, molecules, one which self-assembles into a ring and the other one which self-assembles into a rod. And they combined these two. Um, and you know, if you combine a ring with a rod, apparently you get a helix, uh, you self-assemble the helix. So the problem here was that we don't have a model for a helix, uh, not the flattened helix that they had uh, created. So we needed to find out whether what we see in the scattering pattern was actually from a helix or whether it was from something else. So I wrote this simulation program, right, which can take SDL files. And in that SDL file, I can um, adjust each parameter of my helix step by step. And so we could play around with, for example, the pitch of this helix and see what, how that would affect the scattering pattern. We could uh, change the diameter of the entire helix. Um, we can change the number of twists and see how that, again, affects uh, our situation. And we could si even simulate things like springy motions, right? If these things are constantly in motion, that will affect the scattering pattern as well. So we did all those simulations. Uh, we could not do the fit, but we could uh, sort of fit by eye uh, these things and describe what is happening here. Uh, for example, when we're heating up these helices, are we going to increase in this springy motion, um, thereby uh, uh, changing the scattering pattern for us? Um, so with that, I think I have... <laughs> I've, um, talked more than I should have. Um, so just to round up, if you want to contact me in any way, here are some various ways that you can contact me, either on Twitter, uh, via email. You can look at my website, which is the weblog that I've run since my PhD. So there's a lot of information there um, on X-ray scattering. And there's a YouTube channel with uh, some videos about mostly about X-ray scattering. Um, if you're interested to know what we do on the mouse, uh, we have a Google Scholar profile for that instrument as an H index of nine, if you believe in H indexes, H indices. Um, 
but here you can basically find all the papers that uh, that we did um, where the mouse had contributed. So I would like to thank everybody who's been essential to the success of my career so far. I'm sure that I've missed many people here who uh, really should have been on this list, uh, but these are the people that I could uh, that I um, could um, uh, come up with on short notice. I hope that I can uh, extend this list with some more names in the future. Thank you all very much for your attention. I'll be very happy to answer some questions.